Can't believe it, but it's been six years since I got this suppressor. I've put a lot of shots through it. It's gotten very dirty and it's gotten heavy. So recently I went about trying to clean it up. And the first thing I used is this piston clean carbon remover. The bottle says the working temperature is 90 to 180 degrees. So I put it in my ultrasonic cleaner and tried to bring it up to the higher end of that spectrum. You can see it turned this deep purple. It seemed to do a pretty good job and it softened up a lot of stuff. The parts where I was able to get in here with something to do a little bit of scraping, the stuff came out pretty easy. So pretty happy with piston clean, but it's not really the subject of today's video. I wanna get back to this because I'm curious how it would work as a patch solvent for barrels or as a soak for muzzle brakes. So look out for another video on this. Now, one thing I learned about my ultrasonic cleaner while I was using the piston clean is that it has got some really hot spots. It etched the finish right there and yep over here i don't think that's super uncommon in cheap ultrasonic cleaners so once i started seeing that i didn't run it in the ultrasonic anymore so i tried a couple other things nothing was really effective so i was really left with the last resort which a lot of people call the dip it's a 50 50 mixture of hydrogen peroxide and distilled vinegar your standard strength so three percent let me double check that yes three percent hydrogen peroxide and vinegar with a 5% acid strength. That mixture is very good at dissolving lead, but the problem is that it creates lead acetate, and lead acetate is awful, terrible stuff. Water-soluble, extremely bioavailable, soaked through your skin, sort of terrible. Like this isn't the same as hysteria over the lead alloys we use to make bullets, or the lead that's used in our bullets. You know, do what you gotta do and just be sure to wash your hands. Seems to be working for me with this stuff, but lead acetate is a different story altogether. So I've been aware of this method since, you know, back whenever I was planning to buy my first suppressor. And every time this is brought up, people warn about the lead acetate, but it seems like a lot of people just don't listen. They do it anyway, they dump it down the toilet and move on with their life. For one, I'm not that stupid. And for two, I got a septic system, man. This stuff isn't going anywhere. So I want to be very careful. Well, so let's go back to 2018. I saw a video by Nile Red called Growing Lead Crystals. I have a casual interest in chemistry. I follow several chemistry channels, but I don't know anything about chemistry. But this Nile Red video made me think that this might be something I could use to break down that lead acetate and get it back into, into lead metal. It is extremely simple. He just prepared a solution of lead acetate in water and then dunked in a piece of zinc and the zinc takes the place of the lead in the lead acetate. So you're left with zinc acetate and plain old elemental lead that grows into an awesome crystal structure. So could it really be as simple as dipping our suppressor in our solution and then just putting some zinc in there to make things much safer? So that's basically the test I wanna show you today. I set out to recreate the experiment in our context to see if it's gonna be effective. I hope you like time lapses because we got a bunch of them here, folks. So for peroxide, I use 16 ounce containers, 473 milliliters, and then an equal amount of vinegar. But some of the later tests where I needed to get a little bit higher to make sure everything was submerged, I just topped off with vinegar. So the first question I had is just how much lead can we dissolve with that much solution? So I put a layer of pure lead round balls at the bottom of a jar and dumped in our stuff. You'll notice I've got a thermocouple dangling in there. I wanted to monitor the temperature and my, my peroxide and vinegar were at room temperature. So, it, and the temperature only went up to around 75 when the reaction was its most vigorous. And my peroxide and vinegar were room temperature to start with. So not all that much temperature change. You'll see the snow in the background. The ambient temperature was around 35 degrees, but the solution stayed in that mid seventies range for quite a long time. So. If I was running this at a much higher ambient temperature, it might have gotten a little hotter than I'd like. So you can see white stuff starts forming, bubbling, some brown stuff shows up right there on the surface of the lead. All of the white precipitate just starts raining down like a snow globe. So the reaction was pretty vigorous. And what I waited for was the temperature to start dropping. Like I said, it was in the mid 70s. Like once it got down, or actually, so at, at the one hour mark, it was at 68. So I went ahead and stirred the solution around a little bit and it immediately climbed back up. And then after another hour, it was down to 64. And when I stirred it again that time, there wasn't really much temperature change. 
So I let this go for several more hours and then overnight. I really wanted to dissolve as much lead as I could. So in total, it was in there about 15 hours. So after I removed the lead, I just let the jar sit to let everything settle out. So weighing the lead balls before and after, we were able to dissolve 40.94 grams, which is a lot. So that's 1.4 ounces or 631.8 grains. I thought that was pretty impressive. So I let this settle for 10 hours and then I carefully poured off the top part, the clearer part, into a separate jar. And then the jar that just had the white powdery precipitate on the bottom, I filled it up with water. I didn't have distilled water, but I did use reverse osmosis filtered water. So yeah, it is what it is. I don't think water contamination was an issue in any of the tests, but just wanted to mention it. So after that, I left them overnight to settle again. And you can see they both still kind of have that milky white color. And the jar that I had poured the clear, the clear-ish liquid into didn't develop very much settling at the bottom. So the main reason I did this is I wanted to make sure that white powder wasn't something that was water soluble, but all of the you know vinegar and peroxide and everything was keeping it from dissolving. And I didn't see any evidence of that. Like the amount of white junk at the bottom of that right hand jar didn't seem to reduce that I could tell. Now for my zinc, I actually ordered some from Roto Metals. I wanted to make sure I was working with some pure stuff because I, I just, I wanted to see this process go just like I was expecting. But zinc is everywhere. You stop by your local tire shop and pick up zinc wheel weights. So it's cheap and easy to get, but I just, I wanted to make, I wanted to have some that I was pretty certain about. So I created coils, like you can kind of see going on over here in this jar, because I wanted to make sure I had enough surface area so things could happen quickly. It'd be pretty cool to grow one of those big crystal structures like in the Nile Red video, but I didn't think our lead acetate concentration would be high enough to grow them because he had posted another video later where he was working with some more dilute solution and he was only able to grow lead sponge, which is mostly what we're gonna be doing here. So everything had settled out, they'd been sitting overnight and I dropped a zinc coil into each one and things started happening quickly. That left jar especially, remember that's the, the one we poured into the clear liquid, it starts growing quick. And at this point I'm thinking like, wow, maybe we will end up growing some big crazy crystal structure, but it slowed down pretty quickly. Now the one in the back, you'll see it's kind of growing a little fuzzier looking, no metallic sparkling, but things are still happening. Now on the closer jar, you'll see this line of particles I thought it was bubbles. Like when it was happening in real time, I could see this line. So I started marking the jar where I saw the line so I could come back and see if it had moved. Because remember, 100 speed, this stuff is taking a while. And once the line got near the bottom of the zinc, things really seemed to slow down a lot. So I stretched out the coils, dropped them a little bit lower. That line seemed to move quickly down. And also the other jar seemed to really pick up speed here and start growing its fuzz a little bit faster than it was. So after two hours, I lifted the coils out of the solution and rinsed them in a jar of fresh water. Then I scraped the, the, uh, the lead metal off of the zinc coils to clean them up and returned it back into the solution. So I repeated that process for several more hours and just keep, kept getting more and more lead on the coils. So at this point, I'm extremely confident. Everything is progressing exactly like I hoped. Nothing unexpected has happened, except maybe the, the white precipitate. I still don't know what that is. I've done some research, I've got some ideas, but I'm just not sure. Most importantly to me, it's not water soluble. So yeah, so feeling confident, I decide to go ahead and start the suppressor. This is where everything goes wrong. Like I mentioned before, I did top this one off with vinegar. So a little bit more vinegar than hydrogen peroxide, but I don't think that was a factor in this happening. Like this brown, gross 
nasty stuff starts coming out, solutions getting murky and cloudy, and this wasn't at all what I expected. I expected a bluish solution like this. So I ended up running out of daylight and I let it soak overnight and this mess is what I was left with. So I got the suppressor out, got it washed up, cleaned off, and I went ahead and dropped a zinc coil into my brown mystery solution. And a little bit of stuff seemed to be happening, but when I lifted this thing out of there, it was just covered in this black, nasty, disgusting stuff. So at that point, well, the first thing I did was I got that stupid jar out of my house as quickly as I could. So at this point, I am lost. I had no clue what might have happened. And this was, it was Saturday. My videos go up on Sunday. So I'm like, I don't even have time to make a different video. What am I doing? What am I going to do? You're a freaking hill jack trying to do chemistry on your front porch in mason jars. So a little bit later, I've, I've, I've had the suppressor soaking to make sure I got all the nasty out of it. But when I, when I took it out and I was drying it off, there were these weird brown marks that looked like plating. It was kind of copper looking. It looked like it had, there was a section of this that had been copper plated and it was the same way here on the end cap. It's gone now, you can see, but there was this copper crap. It was everywhere that this had touched. I had run, you know, I had run that through the center of the suppressor so that I could lift it and drop it and handle it easier. Well, this used to be a brush. I ordered a set of brushes, stainless steel brushes, because there was one size, it was early on during my cleaning efforts, I thought I might be able to get it in there without damaging the bristles too much. It didn't work at all. But I, I had some of these brushes laying around. There was one that just had tiny, tiny little bristles, which was this one right there. Well, you'll notice there's no more bristles. That's what happened. All of the bristles in this brush made of, you know, whatever Chinesium they were made of, that's what made everything go wrong. And just to be sure, I grabbed another one of the brushes, mixed up another jar of solution, dunked it in there, and it immediately started turning brown. So it's, it's frozen solid now, but you can see still the, that brown color. And if you put it right next to the other one, you can see same, same rusty brown. Now at this point, I've already kind of moved on and I'm, I'm starting to make another video because all of this was a waste. But I went ahead and put the suppressor into a fresh jar of solution, which is that right there. And you can see that it turned nicely blue. Now the problem here is time. I just, I ran out of time. So this had to go, so the suppressor went in at 4 p.m. yesterday and I took it out around midnight. So it got about eight hours of soak. So I immediately dropped the coil into it turned on the cameras and went to bed. So this reaction has been a little bit underwhelming, but there's definitely some stuff going on. Now weighing my suppressor before and after, this solution plus the other solution that, that turned nasty, it's only lost six grams. And earlier the solution we were work with, working with, I had dissolved 40 grams, right? So there's just, there's not that much lead in here right now, but it was all I had time for. So it definitely needs to go back in for a while. And to be honest, I, like, I don't think the effectiveness of the method is questioned by anybody, right? It works. It just leaves you with a toxic mess. So I forgot to mention something. I'm going to splice it in at the appropriate spot. So the lead that I recovered was all spongy. Like once I had it dried off and was able to touch it, it was spongy. It was full of water. I tried my best to squeeze out the water and get some idea about what it weighed, but I don't think I did a very good job. So if you remember, we dissolved 40 basically 41 grams of lead into the solution. And what I collected looks like around 55. So we gained 15 grams. And I think it's not only water, but also probably zinc as well, right? But still, I'm choosing to take the fact that it was a lot of recovered material as a positive thing. I think we got a lot of it. All right, back to my normal train of thought. So my plan going forward is gonna to be to have like a five gallon bucket, just a plastic bucket, put a nice layer of zinc wheel weights on the bottom. I do my dip and then just pour it in there, put the lid on it and call it done. Now there's hydrogen gas being produced, so you don't want to seal it up, but I think what I'm going to do is either maybe cut out the very center of the lid. That way if it's, if it tipped over, it wouldn't spill as long as you kept it less than half, half empty, I'm thinking, but still allows air exchange. And then just over time, once that evaporates off, maybe you glove up, put on the hazmat suit and get in there and, uh, scrape all the crap off of your zinc, collect up all of the dry powdery junk and seal it in something for a little bit easier disposal maybe. Now I did just buy, I bought another suppressor recently and I'm thinking that you know maybe a once a year dip is gonna be worth the time and trouble. Cause listen, it's trouble, it can be dangerous. 
but it seems a little less dangerous when we throw some zinc at it. I think that's it. Have I said everything I need to say? I'd love to hear from some folks with some chemistry knowledge about what you think. The other thing, so, so the blue here is copper. So I might look and, and see if there's something easy that would knock that out of solution because I don't think it's particularly safe to be around either. I guess for me, it comes down to this. This jar, I know what's in it. It's not good stuff, but I, I do know what's in it. The other jar with the piston clean from my ultrasonic cleaner, no clue what's going on in there. All right, I think that's it, folks. I could finally get this out of my house. All right, folks, I think that's it. I'll see you guys next time.